Uh, my name is Keith Nab, and uh, here we are at the second of three STEM talks that we're going to have this semester. So uh, we're very, very, very happy to have you here. And so STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And today's talk is going to focus on the E part of that acronym, the engineering. So we're uh, very lucky to have uh, Ray Beatty here today. He, is, uh, he has a degree in mechanical engineering, and he works for a company, Ace Metal Crafts. And they design uh, stainless steel products. So they design them and develop them for uh, the pharmaceutical industry and also for the food industry. So very interesting stuff if you've ever wondered what uh, mechanical engineers actually do. So he's going to talk a little bit uh, about that process. Uh, so we thank you all for coming. Uh, we thank the library for this wonderful space uh, to hold these talks. And basically, Ray is going to speak for about 45 to 50 minutes. And then we'll have about 5 or 10 minutes at the end for questions. So how does that sound? Sounds good. All right, so let's give uh, a nice warm welcome to Mr. Ray Beatty. Am I on? Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Keith. Um, for the um, as Keith said, I graduated from University of Illinois. Uh, with a mechanical engineering degree uh, back in uh, 2002. Um, my primary interest at that point was drawing. I, used, I was drawing on Pro-E Modeler, 3D Modeler, which was fairly um, sophisticated at the time. We had uh, drawing um, library. In our library, we had a computer lab where we used the 3D modeling software. When I made it out to my first job, I was hired because we were using AutoCAD and wanted to update to a 3D program named Solid Edge. So my job was to develop the 3D system from scratch. I set up all the standard part libraries. I built all of our templates. I built all of our design models. Um, our hand drafting used to take four to six hours to draft uh, 2D drawings. From a 3D modeling perspective with design models, we we're able to cut that down to 20 minutes. What you're going to find today is I'm going to talk a lot about technology and the engineer's role in developing it within a company. Um, through the years, I have worked on many softwares now and developed new systems everywhere I've been. So as I found myself at my new company, which is Ace Metal Crafts, uh, I was hired as a layout engineer. So initially, all I was doing was designing flat parts, programming lasers, programming equipment. But my job developed into a greater role of project engineering, where I was developing job plans, and to uh, further development where I was doing com some IT work in systems development, developing computer systems, updating our ERP system, and developing some lean processes, which I'll get into a little later. So Ace Metal Crafts, so what do we do? We are stainless steel manufacturers. We like to be the best at what we do. We want to be the best in our industry, and we develop our processes through continuous improvement to ensure that we are. So our customers come to us because they have a need for sanitary stainless steel weldments, uh, food processing, uh, waste management, uh, all sorts of industries where sanitary weldments are required. So some of our biggest customers, Provisor Technologies, they develop processing equipment which cuts lunch meats. They develop processing equipment which forms chicken nuggets, meat processing for McDonald's, different areas in manufacturing where our skills are used. We develop for BW containers in Romeoville we develop for beer industry, bottle washers. We build canning equipment, all stainless steel requirements for these customers. Another one of our large customers is Thomas Engineering. They build, they make pills. They have tablet pressing machines and pill coating machines. Centresis, wastewater management. They develop large um, centrifuges which separate water from slurry or waste product. Um, it's used by municipalities across the country and even the world. And they're replacing settling tanks 
with these large centrifuges that spin at about 3,000 RPM to remove the water. They're also finding uh, industries in fracking where they're removing water from oil during the fracking process as EPA requirements go up. Why do the customers come to ACE? They come to us because we have uh, welding and polishing techniques and processes that are better than the competition. We have an understanding of stainless steel and its properties and how it moves, how it welds, and our engineering focus is on high precision, custom manufactured products. Our customers order from us on short runs, custom products, one to two to three pieces at a time. It's, everything's custom and they need it perfect. If they order a frame, a frame may have a thousand components, two thousand components. Those components have to be perfect. The frame length, 40 foot frame, must be within an eighth of an inch. 40 foot frame straightness must be within 60 thousandths. Every element, there are mounting locations, thousands of them, that have to be within 10 thousandths of an inch. How do you produce this precision on a frame? Our engineers are taught to understand motion of metal. When it welds, shrinkage. When stainless steel heats, it expands. When, it's, when it cools, it contracts. Starts like this, finishes like this. Any joint can move by 15 thousandths of an inch. Our engineers have to account for that and develop frames that finish within 10 thousandths on mounting locations. So our customers come to us because we're perfect. What else do they need? They need repeatability. If they manufacture a part, and then six months down the line, they need a replacement. That replacement needs to fit. It needs to fit on the original part and any time in the future. It is very critical that we have repeatability. How do we achieve that? We have perfect processes. Every one of our jobs is planned. Every single hole that's tapped is planned. Every single element of every part has to be planned and given to our factory in a way that, it, that they can easily and quickly fabricate. Lead times. Customers are coming to us looking for parts in four weeks, three weeks, two weeks. Complicated assemblies, first time runs. Sometimes it's a previous that they want done in a week because it's a replacement part for a assembly line that's down. So as engineers, we need to respond quickly. We need to get this information processed and we need to update our systems to handle that. Another, uh, another reason our customers come to us is our industry knowledge. As engineers, we're expected to go out to our customers, visit their facilities, understand their parts, understand the sanitation requirement for that specific customer, build, the, build a database of information which allows us to produce a perfect part for them every time. Um, our company, our quality numbers are at 98%. That's on mostly custom parts. 50% of our jobs are new, first time, and will never repeat. 50% of our jobs do repeat. So we improve our processes on all jobs to ensure that we have the, that we produce the best parts possible. So what sets these metal crafts apart from our competition? We focus on training our employees at Ace Metal Crafts. Um, our engineers, they are required to go to book clubs. We do read books about lean processing. We read books about accounting. We read books about parenting. Training is everything there, and we're constantly being exposed to new ideas, broader parts of the business. We have to understand uh, elements that are normally out of our range so that we can improve all processes across the board. So some of the things that we have is we have some skills that set us apart. We have four design softwares right now in our company. All of our layout engineers are proficient in AutoCAD, SolidWorks, SolidEdge, and Autodesk. Um, our technology includes lasers, where we're programming those at our machines, machining centers for our lathes and our mills, robotics, we have robotic welders, automated seam welders, automated TIG welders. We have computers available at every shop floor station where we can access 3D models right where our, where our team is working. And we have software available 
throughout the company where we can view any print, any job at any time to improve our systems. One of the tools that we use is called Lean Manufacturing. What this is, is this is a, this is, this comes from Toyota production principles. Toyota, we're all familiar with, they have factories in the United States for automotive, but what they've done is they've taken the concept of leaning up your manufacturing to as minimal inventory as possible and as quickly, as quick production as possible. So let me kind of explain where my company stood uh, eight years ago before starting Lean. We were very good at projecting future requirements, keeping materials on hand for inventory, building parts, having them in process to release them to our customers quickly, sitting on shelves, taking up space. What the Lean principle is, is to reduce inventory to as minimal as possible and improve your production flow and speed to as quickly as possible to minimize the effect of having inventory on the shelves. So if you have a million dollars in inventory and you reduce that inventory by 500,000, that becomes working capital for your company to expand. It also removes that inventory from your shop floor to increase your available capacity within your building. So how do you achieve that? What, what tools do we have? One of them is continuous improvement. They have some uh, catchphrase sayings at Toyota, um, inch wide, mile deep. If you find a problem, don't just repair the problem. Find the root cause of that problem and eliminate it from ever happening again. So if you missed a tap hole, instead of just saying, hey, why do we miss, let's just fix this hole, you instead ask the question, why do we miss it? Who was missing information? Why didn't that get done? How come it wasn't signed off? When we're working with weldments that have thousands of parts, we have to make sure every single element is done or we, that will be rejected. Always a problem. This is another thing that comes up regularly. If you do not have a problem, they consider that a problem. There is always room for improvement in a manufacturing facility. There is always room to speed things up. There's always room to do things better. And the only way to know what you need to speed up is to create a problem. In scheduling, if you're scheduling jobs to get done in four days and you're getting them done in three days, that's a problem. You have to improve your scheduling. You have to make your scheduling tighter to expose the problems that are constraining your production. It's how you drive down lead time. Just-in-time manufacturing is another tool. You do not order parts early. You do not produce parts early. Things are produced at the rate at which they're built. So as engineers, we control this. We do our job planning. We do our scheduling. We do everything that we can to make all parts come together at the exact same time. If parts come together at the same time, they, they will flow through the shop more quickly, more efficiently, and we will get things done cheaper and we'll make money. Another tool that we use is a Kaizen. This is a group event. We will get 10 to 12 people together from all areas of the company, um, purchasing, engineering, uh, order entry from the shop floor, uh, upper management, and we will get together and investigate a process that we have isolated as, as one that we want to improve. Uh, I was part of a team earlier this year where we decided that it was taking us too long to quote to our customers and purchasing was not getting the information soon enough to, to purchase parts on time. So we were getting late deliveries because of this. So how do we address this? We've got our team together and we did something called process mapping where we took every single work center which a work center is defined as a area of, an area where an employee works. In this case, it was order entry, it was project planning, estimating, layout, purchasing. And we took these work centers and mapped the processes of how they get done in our facility and figured out where our bottlenecks were that were holding up our ability to get our quotes out quickly and get our information to purchasing. 
So we found the bottlenecks, and as a group, we came up, we restructured the process. Positions were created, positions were eliminated, people were moved, we moved computers, we moved everything in our front office to accommodate a better process to process our estimates through our production. And what we ended up accomplishing was we reduced our quoting time by about 50%, and we went paperless in our engineering departments, and we ended up purchasing our parts in a timely manner for our production teams. So one thing that happens over time with continuous improvement is a synergy. So if you have a part, if, you have a, if a job planner can finish a job in eight hours and you can improve his process to save him five minutes of time, he'll, pr he'll begin producing his jobs in 55 minutes. Well, if you can continue to make improvement after improvement, you make six improvements, which saves him a half hour of time. In a day, eight jobs, he saves four hours of time. But because all of those improvements have worked together, what really has happened is, is instead of completing eight jobs in a day, he's completed 16. So instead, he saved himself eight hours in that individual day. So we try to make incremental small improvements consistently to our processes within our departments to improve the speed at which jobs get done. So engineering-wise, in, when, I, when I became a project engineer, it was a new learning experience for me. Um, I had to learn a lot more about equipment, a lot more about how our equipment functions in our shop floor. When we get a new piece of equipment in our shop floor, and one engineer will be assigned to work with our production team to learn exactly how that equipment works. Specifications are documented the limitations of the equipment. Every single part of that is documented. After that engineer has learned about that equipment, he'll share that with the rest of the team. It is vital for, net, for our engineers to know exactly what they need to be, what, exactly how our machines work for us to plan our jobs appropriately. Um, another thing that we discovered with a Kaizen event was that we were having trouble flowing parts through our front end operations. Um, we call this our pacemaker value stream. And what the value stream is, is it's a grouping of operations that many of our parts run through on a regular basis. So these are front end operations at our lasers, our press brakes for forming parts, our sheet metal operations for drilling and tapping parts, and then our deburring operations for cleaning them up. So we measure velocity by time of a part on the shop floor compared to the scheduled time within the shop floor. So if you have a part that's scheduled to be on the shop floor for 10 days and it takes 20, that's a velocity of two. If you have a part that's on the shop floor scheduled for 10 days and it takes five, that's a velocity of 0.5. Ideally, your parts will flow at the exact speed that you planned for. So your ideal velocity would be one. When we had first started, we were in January, when we had first started looking at the velocity in our pacemaker value streams, we discovered that we were at 2.75. So that means that we planned for parts on average to be on the shop floor for 10 days, and they took 27.5 if, if it was a 10-day part. So we discovered reasons for this. People were releasing jobs early on purpose because they were afraid they were going to be late. People were ordering materials late because the engineers weren't getting information to purchasing. So over the course of time, we isolated this problem of velocity and we improved our processes within our nesting operations, within our engineering operations, across the board to get jobs so that when we would nest a job, it would not be nested and released to our production uh, teams until the day before it was to be in the schedule instead of releasing them early. And then our purchase parts we were releasing our jobs from engineering early enough for purchasing to purchase all available parts so we weren't closing our operations late. And in time, we got our velocity below one. So one thing that we've had done is we've had the TSSC Toyota group 
that is a group of consultants from Toyota come to our facility. They've worked with our engineers, they've worked with our production teams, they've worked with everybody in our facility to improve our processes, improve our flow. They have started out in our shipping department. We rearranged our entire shipping department, drew avenues for different value streams to unload their work. We, we drew outlines of trucks on our shop floor so that we knew exactly where, how far to fill our truck. We organized all of our releases in sequence so that our shipping department was running more efficiently. We walked backwards through our entire facility and we worked through our inspection departments, our welding and grinding departments, and straight through to our engineering departments to improve the flow. Another project that I was a part of was the implementation of a brand new ERP system. An ERP system is enterprise resource planning. It is the heart of the information within a company. Sales has a pocket of information, um, usually pertaining to customers, uh, what their market is, how much value they have. Engineering has a bucket of information pertaining to how to build parts, what, the, what part flow is, you know, how long does something take. Uh, production has processes on how to fabricate, in our case welding, grinding, polishing. All of these bits of information are isolated in different areas of the company. An ERP system is a massive database of information. It's accessible by anybody at any time and it joins together these islands of information so that I can instantly take a look at a customer, understand all of the requirements of that customer. I can take a look at our production processes and know the standard operating procedures that we've developed for those processes. The control of information is key in these. One of the things our ERP system has helped us do is improve scheduling. So we try to schedule our jobs to run in a sequence. A, a, we are a job shop. So when we get jobs, we may get an order today for a part that's due in a week, or may, we may get an order tomorrow for a part that's due in six months. And our customers all have different lead time requirements, and they're constantly throwing new projects into the mix. It's different from a production shop where you have a planned production ahead of time. We don't know what we're fabricating until four weeks before it ships. So how do we handle that type of load? It's easiest to think of if you think of a theme park where you have a line of work to do, or a line, a line of people, they're standing in line waiting to get into a ride. So I'm standing in line, and the ride tells me I have an hour. So my customer orders a part, and they, they expect to get that in an hour. Well, if you're walking in line, and people keep shuffling in front of you because new orders are coming in, and you don't get, your, get to the ride for two hours, you're probably gonna be annoyed. If instead, you have a fast lane, like they do at most of the theme parks, and there are people rolling in, and you know they're getting in front of you, but you are still able to get through in your hour, you're probably not as upset. What we were doing to our customers before was we were, we were scheduling, and we were backward infinite scheduling, which means that we took a job, said here's the due date, here's how long it takes to build it, and I'm gonna schedule accordingly. So what we would end up with was this. We would have capacity here. Today, we'd be over capacity. Tomorrow, we'd be under capacity. And then going forward, we would have these buckets. So over time, some parts would get pushed out, some parts would get done early, but we weren't scheduling to our capacity. Our, what our new ERP system allowed us to do is it would tell us when we had met a capacity constraint and force us to schedule into the next day. So we would level out our scheduling for our production teams and we would build in sequence. So everybody was working at the same part on the same line at the same time. So we would flow our, our parts through more quickly and we would have less uh, variance in our capacity plans. 
So how do we do this? Well, what did it take to get an information system that would schedule our parts? Uh, the first thing it takes is good data. Uh, we have project engineers planning jobs with hours. We review those hours on each job as they come back so that we have an understanding of how long it's taking to manufacture parts. So our project engineers, they will schedule according to the exact times that things take and then our schedule will hold because when one person finishes their operation, the next person in line, it's immediately up at the top and all of our parts follow that same flow. So another key element is data collection. Out on our shop floors uh, last year, we had manual entry of our job uh, time cards. Our employees were taking lists, writing down what job and operation they worked on, funneling that information to our engineers, and our engineers were manually entering this to calculate efficiencies. And then we were using that information to adjust our times on jobs. What we've done is we've switched over to barcode scanning and we are processing our parts through using, using our ERP system so we know exactly where they are at any time on the shop floor. We have real-time data if, if our production members have gone over times so we know if, they're, if our efficiencies are being hurt. And then we can calculate efficiency instantly on any job. So what used to be about a 40-hour collection of efficiency reports every month, our ERP system handles automatically and spits out the data to us. We don't even, it, it gets emailed to us once a month. We don't even have to address it. It just comes to our email accounts. So what do we do to manage our capacity? Each of our work centers has been mapped through our entire company. Every one of those work centers is assigned a certain number of hours per week of available capacity. As we plan through and generate our capacity schedules each week, that capacity is constrained by our team leaders. When I schedule a job, if I'm scheduling into capacity, it will stop me from, from releasing that job. It'll force me to contact the customer, give them a realistic ship date, and keep our capacity going in a linear flow. Uh, first of all, thank you for talking to tell us more about your career in engineering. Um, I know how daunting it is to talk to students. I gave a presentation myself recently. Um, I have more question about your education, going to engineering. Uh, many of us are in our earlier years. Uh, of our education, and I was wondering how you would describe your uh, preceding courses to have prepared you for your later years in education. Um, do you feel like they give you the right equipment to um, excel in your later courses, or was it a constantly increasing challenge uh, as your coursework went on? That's an okay. So my early years in my uh, in my engineering uh, started in high school with the uh, first computer lab in our high school department. Uh, as I went through college, um, we went through some pretty advanced mathematics, physics, thermal dynamics, heat transfer, fluid dynamics. There's a lot of different coursework that goes into engineering. Most of that I don't use on a daily basis. Um, what it prepared me was not stand of what it takes to get work done. I don't know what's going on with that. Flip that camera. Okay. So when I, when I got out of college, most of what I needed to know for engineering had to do specifically with drafting, um, drawing pictures, for lack of a better term. Uh, we did, I drew prints for customer approval, which were mostly call outs and giving a, a general overview of how a part was going to look at the end. We had prints for manufacturing, uh, assembly prints custom section views, instructions, weld instructions, grinding instructions, finishing instructions, all sorts of instructions on a print as to how to manufacture. We had individual part drawings with forming dimensions, information on how to make an individual part. I think I spent a total of eight credit hours in college working on drafting. And in my day-to-day -day work, that was what I did every day. 
But what I did learn in college and what, I, what, I, what became very useful over time was I learned how to problem solve. I learned how to figure things out. I learned how to get through things I'd never seen before, how to do things. Um, in college, we had fluid dynamics. We had to calculate the flow, th the speed of flow around a rotating cylinder. All right, a very simple problem, right? So you have an, ex so we were told to use a computer program to figure this out. Most people at the time were in Fortran, all right? I don't know how many of you have used Fortran or any of the older computer stuff. But it's a little cumbersome to figure out exactly, you know, how this stuff works. I chose Excel, so I enjoy programming. I enjoy programming in Excel. So over time, what I did was I wrote one Excel document that you could populate in four little values, and it would calculate flow around a rotating cylinder, and it would give you a charted graph and all sorts of things. Right? It kind of college kind of taught you how to figure out problems in unique ways, which is very much required in engineering. So as time went on, um, I think I used thermal dynamics once. I, I was designing kitchen equipment in my uh, first job. So we had to figure out exactly how freezers worked and how burners worked and all sorts of things. So those sorts of things, they didn't come up very often in my design work. Most of my design work I learned on the fly, I learned on my job. So my, I, w I, would, I came in as, uh, you know, inexperienced engineer with grumpy shop people. I had never worked <laughs> as in sheet metal. I didn't understand how things formed, how things moved, how I never understood. I, I, I had to learn all that on the fly. So we had a grumpy shop foreman named Chester. <laughs> and uh, Chester was, uh, he was really good at what he did. He was the best assembly guy we had. And he was disappointed in me because I didn't know how to do anything. I was fresh out of college. That's how it works. You come out of college, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so what did Chester do? I'd come out to him. I'd lay something out wrong. He'd go and try to form. It wouldn't work. He'd fix it, and he'd give me, you know. <sighs> <laughs> That's how he responded. He did that to everybody, every single person. I still remember the day that I earned Chester's respect. All right? He was, he was the best guy out there. So the day that I earned his respect, he was out in the field. He was working on a part. And he needed a part out to him in an hour. And I was a layout engineer, still green, been there, I don't know, six months, no good. He calls me. He says, Ray, I need this part. Spends about five minutes explaining to me a part over the phone. All sorts of bends, whole locations, complex geometries, everything. And he's out in the field. He asks me if I understand. I say, yeah, yeah, I got it. He goes, <sighs> <laughs> So he comes back the next day, and that part fit perfectly. From then on, me and Chester were like this. So then I just heard him sighing about everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so to answer your question as to how college prepares you, it gets you ready. You, it gets you an understanding. You, you know what you, you've got to do. Um, recently, when, when I mentioned that we had implemented an ERP system, I was asked to head up the... Uh, data side and the customization of this system. What is ERP? It's the system that runs this whole company. When, when order entry enters an order, how does it get to an engineer? In the past, what we did was we filled out slips of paper, walked them across buildings, handed them to engineers. We had card systems up on walls all over the place. It was ugly. It was terrible. So when I got to this company, and this was the way it ran, everybody was very proud of this, this card system. And I looked at it like, whew. And we had this card system, and I, I felt sick about it. So over the course of time, as our company grew, we realized the need for improved systems. When I started there, we were a $12 million company. Within five years today, we're an $18 million company. With that sort of growth, you have to improve your processes. They have to grow. You, you, can't, just, you can't just sit stagnant. Well, we, we started to realize that our ERP system wasn't doing it. Our card systems on the wall weren't doing it. Uh, uh, order entry, handing a piece of paper, and relying on that to, make, to get an order process wasn't doing it. So we implemented this ERP system. So now when order entry enters an order, there's no handoff. There's no paper. There's, there's nothing. What happens is, is a small grid on my screen pops up and says, hey, you got a new order. Hey, here's when you need to work on it. 
hey, it's in order. Here's what you need to work on. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. In order of what jobs need to go out, what jobs need to go out. So as part of the ERP system team, the implementation team, I was expected to learn a software I had never seen before. I was expected to learn Visual Basic Script, expected to learn how SQL Server works. I was expected to learn how to customize an entire software system to best flow the information for our company. I needed to understand how every process worked in our company. I needed to understand what triggers would cause order entry to send it to one project engineer as opposed to another. Who has the most work on their plate? How can we balance out this load to get all of our jobs out in the correct order? So I learned Visual Basic Script. Um, we had an implementer come in, and we were implementing an ERP system called M1. So what is M1 in relation to me? I worked as like the brain of the whole operation. So when we first had M1, we had this big room of people, and they were all deciding what software we were going to pick. And I knew right away it was going to be M1 because I knew we could customize it to whatever we needed. So I was on the team immediately, and this is typically six to eight months of implementation. So when we had our implementer come in, we told him we're doing it in four months. And he came in and said, okay, well, that's not going to happen. But we said, well, yes, it is because this is what we're going to do. So what do we have to do? We had to take our old archaic ERP system and transfer all the data company asked how are we going to do that, I said, I got it. We had to customize our ERP system so that, when, so that a job planner can do his job more efficiently. When they asked who's got the customization, I said, hey, I've got it. Technology in the, in the ERP system was right up my alley. So what, where do we stand today? We've gone, we've gone from paper documents and manual printing to shop floor boards with job schedules out dual screen monitors out with all of our job plans in order of when they need to be done. We have touch screens at every single workstation out on our shop floor, the barcode scanners to improve efficiency. In engineering, we've reduced our engineering workload to the point where we actually, unfortunately, laid some people off. And at the same time, people are working far less hours than ever before. Um, the new system we have become a marketing tool for M1. They're going to be sending uh, film crews out to our facility in two weeks to film our ERP system. We're having customers come from around the country, potential customers, to review the system to see how it functions. So we've improved all of our flow throughout our entire company. Um, since we've implemented our new ERP system, We have not had a single month where we have uh, lost money. We've been profitable. We had a downturn. Um, we're typically at about 1.5 million per month. Uh, last few months, we were down to 1 million. In those months, what did we do? We cut overtime in advance. We cut uh, our employees in advance. We minimized our costs in purchasing in advance so that we could see our profits continue even though our revenues have dropped. So. I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question, but being in college prepares you for some of the unique circumstances that you're in. Hello. Um, you mentioned uh, a number of times in your uh, discussions just now about teamwork. Um, what kind of things did you do at college that prepared you to work in a collaborative environment? Um, I'll be perfectly honest with you. In college, I was a bit of a rogue and an individualist. All right, I did not play well in uh, groups. If I was in a group, I would take on the project myself. And I very much didn't um, work well in a team. In my first job, this served me extraordinarily well. In my first job, we had a very, very minimal engineering department. We did all of our own custom design. We did all of our own custom fabrication, all of our own installs, everything. Start to finish, somebody would order a product, and they would, uh, they would expect us to produce well. Our engineering department had two people, and our company was two to three million. 
We grew, we expanded into new industries. We were six million, we had two people. We grew, we expanded into new industries. We had 12 million, we had two people in engineering. So it became very much an individualist. Huddle in, work 12 hours a week, kill yourself, get as much work done as possible. Um, slowly over time that company ended up failing. Uh, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they were not able to grow with the expanded business. They ended up having too many mistakes, too many problems, and that was the end, and I moved on. So then I came to my new company. Ace Metal Crafts has a culture that doesn't just encourage teamwork, it forces it. All right, you're forced into groups, you're forced to work with others, you're forced to share information, and it was completely different to the point where I was uncomfortable. When I first started working there, it was, it was hard for me to fit in with a group because I wanted to do the project by myself. I didn't accept other people's opinions. I did what I wanted to do. Well, over time, I learned that I had to work in a team, um, especially since at, this, at Ace Metal Crafts, the skill of the employees was incredibly high. So their opinions were as good, if not better, than mine all of the time. So I had to, I had to adjust. Their training at my company is extreme. Um, weekly, daily, constantly. More of my day is spent learning about new fabrication techniques, how to get things done, working with others, building reports, analyzing data. More of my day-to-day -day time is spent doing that than drafting or job planning or quoting or anything because we have to make sure that we're the best. We have a very large engineering team for the amount of work that we do. Uh, I believe it's 13 people for $18 million worth of work. And we make sure that when we, under, that when we do something, it's perfect for the next guy. Um, I have a question about the lean program of your company. Um, you talked about the importance of speed. Um, with the increased amount of speed, how do you maintain the quality of the product? Um, that's a good question. When we're increasing speed through lean, of course you're trying to attack efficiency, and you want guys to get things done faster, which in turn, if you're getting things done faster, are you rushing through it? Well, if you're rushing through something, you're going to make a mistake. Okay. The thing is, is a part doesn't spend a lot of time being worked on. A part spends a lot of time in queue. So if we go through and release a part into production, it probably spends a day or two waiting to be cut at our laser. So what happens after that? So the laser cuts it. For about two minutes, this part is cut. Now it sits on the laser bed waiting for all the other parts around it to be cut. So the value added time on that part has been two minutes. It's probably been released for two days, all right? So now to move from the laser to the next station, which we would consider deburring, it's probably spending uh, an hour before it gets worked on. Moves on to the next operation. It spends an hour getting worked on before it gets worked on. By the time a part that has a half hour's worth of actual value added work on it has made it through our system, a week has passed. So you don't attack that half hour. You attack the week. So you try to minimize the time that a part stands still to improve flow, to improve speed. How do you achieve that? Smaller batches more frequently. So if I can release, if I give you a, a book, how long does it take for you to read a book? It probably takes you a few hours. If I give you one page of that book, it probably takes you a uh, few minutes. So if I keep handing you one page at a time of a book, you can keep getting those through that work done one page at a time. If instead I hand you a book and tell you to turn to page 238 and you want to read that page, first you have to find it. You have to figure out what you're doing. You have to get all that together. And it takes you additional time just to process the information because you got too big of a batch. So part of what you try to do to speed that flow up is minimize your batch time, maximize your value added time. 
that that's how you improve the speed of a part and improve lead time without even having to address efficiency. Efficiencies are addressed uh, through improvement of processes, documenting of procedures, um, getting new equipment, training your employees better. Those will improve efficiencies, but you don't necessarily have to have somebody work harder on something. You have to have them work on something for a longer period, for a longer percentage of their day. So we need to get a lean engineer to work with the NFL to get game times. It does um, the quest for a more efficient work schedule impact the personal lives of your employees? So the personal lives of our employees is actually thought about by ownership. Um, the company I work for is woman is woman owned company, which is a little bit different because she cares about her employees, which is a little different than anywhere I've worked because most places have cared about, you know, the bottom line or about getting jobs done or things other than their employees. We actually uh, recently won an AMA award for Illinois as the, as the mentally healthiest company in the state. <laughs> uh, we're, gonna, we're actually going to be looking at the AMA for the country next to see how we rank amongst all the states. So our personal lives are part of that. Um, as we've improved efficiency, I've been home longer today than ever before. Uh, instead of instead of just taking that efficiency and putting it to the bottom line, our actual workloads have been reduced over time. So our personal lives have been positively affected by our quest for efficiency. Good. Anybody else? Other questions? Yep. One more back. back here. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, as I've looked at uh, possible career paths uh, later on. Um, I find that a lot of it's all over overlap for engineer and technician. Uh, my question for you is where does your job as an engineer end and that of a technician begin? So day to day engineering for me is the combination of job planning, estimating, layout, and releasing work. That's probably about two hours of my day. The rest of my day is spent working directly with other people, um, working out on the shop floor, giving instructions to our welders, our polishers, working uh, with our sales department, reviewing uh, Excel spreadsheets of data of sales history, um, working with the president of the company, figuring out, hey, uh, Ray, We've got a question. We want to put in a new press break. I want to know how many parts we produce that go onto this press break. How do we figure that out? So I find that my day-to-day -day engineering activities are surpassed by production support. We're working with directly with the guys out on the shop floor, working directly with uh, the managers of the company, figuring out information and figure out ways to improve the way that we're doing things as opposed to just day to day. Here's a drawing, here's a part, here's a layout. I mean, that's a very simple part of the job. We are, we're a manufacturer, not a designer. So our customers send us the designs for the parts. We figure out ways to produce them more efficiently. So th at the end of the day, we're not adding a lot of engineering time to these jobs. But we're, we are figuring out the best way to produce them by working with our team members and coming up with uh, better processes. All right, any other questions, final questions? Okay, I'll turn it. Hello? All right, why don't we say thank you um, to Ray Beatty. And thank you all for coming. Uh, have a wonderful day, and we have another talk uh, next month.